Thank you, Ricardo, for the wonderful introduction. And uh, I have to say, to, to verify that yes, we are indeed friends. And in fact, the first time I came to Barcelona, uh, which was about 15 years ago, uh, that's when I met Ricardo. It was at a different conference, but that what made Barcelona for me, at least then, very, very special and continues to be very special. And thank you all for waking up early for this uh, keynote. <laughs> Hopefully, um, you are in your different time zones still, uh, you know, stay awake enough for, for the duration of the talk. So we're going to talk about this very, you know, different application of AI for nature. The overall, the work that I do, uh, first of all, I'm standing here giving this talk, but I'm presenting the work of a large community of people, large, worldwide community of people. And so when I say we, it is really they. It is very you know, active, passionate, dedicated group that works at this intersection, and it's not a big group. So part of the talk is also I hope the community grows. The work that I do spans really truly from the very, very basics of getting data for nature, how can we use computing and AI particularly to get more data for uh, both for ecology, the science, and for conservation, the all the way to applications. Then how do we translate uh, this data into abstractions and definitions that computation can work on? Both how do we define things, objects like networks and graphs from these data structured objects, but importantly, how do we formulate these data in a way, and the questions on this data, in a way that we can ask questions using AI to generate hypotheses that are testable within the scientific domains of ecology and wildlife biology and biodiversity science. And then how do we extract the patterns from these abstract definitions in a way that have meaning in the domain so that we can answer the questions we posed in the first place in science and make impact in biodiversity and conservation. So I'll give you kind of the two examples of this from the science and from the impact side. So why use AI and science in the first place? So to quote Poincaré, Henri Poincaré, who wrote this beautiful book uh, called uh, Science and Method, and it's pretty thin and I highly recommend it. It's, it's a good read. And it ends in this wonderful quote. The scientific method, as we know it, right, um, consists in observation and experiment. If the scientist had an infinity of time at his disposal, it would be sufficient to say to him, look and look carefully. That's it, right? But since he has not time to look at everything and above all to look carefully, and since it is better not to look at all than to look carelessly, something I tell my students all the time, he's forced to make a selection. And so this question of selection, that's where like good science right, uh, lies. What are the questions? What are you going to look at? And how are you going to look at it carefully? So I would say that all that technology and computing does, including AI, is not changing the scientific method or the process, scientific process at all. All it does is lets us look at more things more carefully, making in the process the invisible visible for various reasons. Particularly in biology, in nature, humans has a, have made sense of nature of the natural world around us by looking and recording their observations for centuries, right? From the very, very, very beginnings to through Darwin's finches and Jane Goodall's uh, primates all the way to the, the, the recent, you know, highly skilled technological ways of, of observing and recording the world. And what technology did in the process, from the microscope 
to the satellites is letting us look at more things at finer scales or at global scales. And so we live in a unique moment where really the proliferation of technology, this explosion over the last 20 years about, really lets us get massive amounts of data about the world, in particular about the natural world, and looking at many, many more things that we've ever been able to look before. This is the satellites and remote sensing, the autonomous vehicles underwater on the ground and in the air, the on-body sensors that measure everything from GPS to the heartbeat and the who is the nearest uh, animal next to you and how they're gesturing with their head or even their, uh, their uh, paws. There are in-situ sensors that is, such as motion-activated cameras, known as trail cameras or camera traps, acoustic sensors, and even these devices that record increasingly more and more information about the natural world. Oh, hey, this is the interactive part. How many of you have taken a picture of a living organism in the last week? All right. For those of you ha who have not raised their hand, may I remind you that humans are living organisms. <laughs> and even if you think you did not take a picture of a living organism, quite often when we take pictures, there's, there's grass, there are trees, there's uh, sp spiders and insects, there's nature that we don't know, the invisible part, right? And recently, there's also technology that allows us to take environmental DNA and understand what are the species that are out there, eDNA. So one would think we solved the data problem, right? There's massive amounts of data about the natural world, so we can look at everything. Well, kind of. When we talk about biodiversity and sort of the scale of biodiversity, the ecological scales of organisms and up, not the molecules and cells, Here's what the data of the world looks like. On the top left is the map of sort of the biodiversity heat map of the world. And then the bottom left is the map of the Global Biodiversity Information Fund. This is a facility. This is GBIF. This is the official biodiversity data that we have about the world. Notice the biases. Notice also that exactly where the hotspots of biodiversity are is where we have the least data. And a similar pattern holds for the largest citizen science uh, nature recording, nature observations recording platform, iNaturalist, which has more than 130 million observations, concentrated mostly in North America and Western Europe. And eBird, which is another citizen science platform for observing eBird, because bird, birders are a whole community unto themselves. Um, so, the, the, and it's, go, it's even worse, this ba uh, bias pattern. It's not that it's concentrated in these kinds of re world regions, but within each region, it's also concentrated in urban areas uh, and around the roads, and within urban areas. It's concentrated around certain parts of these urban neighborhoods. So the correlation between the number of observations is socioeconomic, like very, very strong correlation with socioeconomic factors, nothing to do with nature. So we know a lot about a very tiny portion of the natural world, and then we know nothing for where the majority of the living things actually are. So that's the first problem. We really need to kind of figure out how we actually let scientists and practitioners in, the, in, in biodiversity space look at more things. But even with the things that we already have, by far the largest, most abundant source of information about everything, including the natural world, are images. And over the last 10 years, there is an explosion of methods in computer vision and machine learning that allow us to look at image data much more carefully. So reasonably off the shelf today, we can take an image and you know, using detect detection and localization, find objects of interest, my favorite ones, zebras, uh, put a bounding box around them. We can do species classification-ish, maybe. Um, 
even individual ID, the technology that we have developed over the years. We can do posture estimation. We can do environmental reconstruction, right? So we're done. We have all these methods. So now we can, we have, okay, data and uh, like methods to, to make sense of them, to look at them more carefully. Again, not quite. The problem is that majority of these methods, actually the overwhelming majority, almost all of them have been developed in total absence of any context of biodiversity applications. And that's because the way we develop machine learning methods in the first place, the typical kind of approach for developing machine learning methods is to have stereotype benchmarks, to use a very narrow set of uh, evaluation metrics, uh, variations of accuracy, on large data sets with like kind of problem agnostics, agnostic approaches. So this is from a paper that was recently, um, kind of white paper that was published by a great set of colleagues um, led by David Rolnick. And they, they argue, and I completely agree with this, that this is really not a good way to develop um, application-driven machine learning approaches. Because this approach of massive data sets, what it does, it drives us to develop methods that are more and more and more overfit for the very small part of the not representing part of the entire set of data. Because majority of the data sets in the natural world and in the real world <laughs> for most applications, but certainly in the natural world, are super long tail, where we have a lot of observations, a lot of information about small subset, and then almost nothing for the rest of it. And so this approach of massive data sets you know, doesn't cover the long tail at all. Not only that, but any metrics of accuracy are easily improved over that small part, but highly sampled part of the world, just as we saw it. Again, this long tail not being represented. More, more so, most of these applications, most of these questions are really open set, open world problems with you know, constantly being added and with the biggest, hardest problem being discovery. Discovery of new species, discovery of new scientific hypotheses, discovery of new drivers of biodiversity loss. So, this kind of uh, approach does not, these kinds of questions do not land themselves very well for accuracy measurements. So we need to rethink the whole paradigm of how we actually design machine learning applications. So let me kind of maybe give a couple of examples. So as I said, we have this massive amount of data in images. We even have methods that can pull out all the images that uh, have animals, let's say, in them, uh, or li other living organisms. Ooh. Find where the animals are, put a bounding box, including the, um, this baby elephant behind its mom, and for m many species, not all, um, determine the, who the species are in those images. But what we really want this is great, by the way. It's, it's, it would be happy if it was true for many, many, many more species. But what we really want, this is not only to say this is the species of bird, but this is the species of bird because. Because, because it has you know, white belly, black behind the beak, and we switched for some reason to uh, automatic <laughs> uh, alignment, uh, automatic uh, animation, but okay. Um, so this because, because it has these morphological traits, right, this appearance, because it has white belly, black behind the beak, it wobbles when it walks, and it makes this particular sound in this kind of habitat. All of these are traits and phenotype, you know, the, 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 the collection of traits that make up this and differentiate this species and the function of this species and 
tell us not only about the science of why this species is in this habitat, what is it doing, why is it behaving the way it's behaving, what are the function of all of these black beak behind the, 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 the black behind the beak and wobbling when it walks, but also whether if we're losing it, if it's endangered, why? What's driving the loss? How is it within the fitting within an entire ecosystem? So not only we need this interpretable, evidence-supported uh, machine learning and AI, but AI for science need to make discovery possible, and it needs to make AI interpretable. So an attempt on doing this with images is the new field of science that we're establishing called imageomics. Okay, this is the next part, interactive part of the, of the talk. We all have to learn how to pronounce this word. All right? It's the omics of images, so it's imageomics. So say it with me, with me. imageomics. And you won't get a sticker if you don't pronounce it. So again, imageomics. Uh, reasonably. So, some more further up, you know, if, if, if uh, you need more coffee, <laughs> we'll, we'll, there will be a quiz at the end. So this is a national, U.S. National Science Foundation uh, funded institute uh, that brings together a core of scientists from 11 institutions, but this has grown beyond, at the, by this point, uh, the original team. And the point is to extract biological information particularly traits and phenotype, directly from images, and connect them to function and genotype. And that's the holy grail of biology in many ways, of phenotype to genotype connections. And the way we do it, and the way we think that we can do it now, the reason we can think that we can do it now, is one, we have massive collections of images. Yes, they're biased, but there is a lot in many different spectra with many different kind of views of organisms. So we have a lot more things to look at. We also have a lot of other information that's connected to these images. There's text, there's geospatial information, there's uh, genotype, there's molecular, and other molecular information. So, so there's massive, massive amounts of data. More things to look at, right, through all of the technology. And yes, this is the moment where we can start to look at, uh, to look at more carefully, because biology is also the nature of, the science of structures. There are many, many, many structures in biology, starting with the, uh, you know, phylogeny and evolutionary trees and taxonomy. In fact, taxonomy was, to a large extent, like the, biology is the science of classifying, of taxonomy, of making these structures, of ontologies. There is a whole community of bioontologists that has this massive meetings and creating ontologies and everything from protein function to, uh, to, to ecosystems. And so leveraging these function, these structures to constrain the architecture of machine learning models, that's the knowledge guided uh, machine learning approach. And that was pioneered by, Anush, by Vipin Kumar, Anush Karpatni, and uh, Jia. And so with that together, not only we actually can deal with this biased data and, and, and regions and areas where we don't have enough data, but we can actually make the outcomes more interpretable. So the, the, this injection of the domain into machine learning structures allows us to do both. Use less data, less, more biased data, less structured data, by adding the structures of the domain, also making it interpretable. And so the first thing we did is kind of going to the classic problem, the very basic problem. If we're going to answer anything, the very first thing we need to do is to be able to tell what species we're looking at. It's kind of a basic question. So we build a foundation model for uh, the tree of life. By combining the structure of taxonomy, this kind of very structured information and definition of species in biology, with massive collections of images, um, this is 10 million images, this is, a, this is the first pass. We're building the bigger model, but uh, 10 million images of about 450,000 species. So this is a quiz part, a little bit. How many species of animals, plants, and fungi are there? I'm not counting bacteria, but animals, plants, and fungi are out there in the world. 
yell out something, like order of magnitude. I'm hearing billions. I'm hearing trillions. Okay, raise your hand if you think it's more than 100 million of like total species in the world. All right, if you think less than 100 million, all right, a few hands. So here's the shocking number. Estimated about 10 million, maybe 15 million, 10 million, all of it, animals, plants, and fungi. Okay, we may be off by like a factor of two, but not a factor of 10. And that's the shocking number, that there's very little actually. And so of those 10 million, about two million are named. And the majority of those, of the rest of them, are beetles. <laughs> because to, uh, to, to quote a, an ecologist, Holden, uh, that you know, if God exists, he had an inordinate fondness for beetles. <laughs> so we took about a quarter of all named species and built this foundation model, and it's based on the clip architecture with the addition of taxonomy. And it actually worked amazingly well beyond our wildest imagination, just that addition. It particularly works well for zero shot and few shot. It particularly works well for um, species that look similar to each other, the mimicry, the mimicking species. So all of these biological tasks, not only that, you can do, you, you can come down not to the species level, but to the genus level, to the higher order of taxonomy. And then it allows to work with a scientist in the loop. Because for many species of insects particularly, beetles, yes, beetles, we don't know, scientists do not know the species. Every time you scoop a collection of beetles, you're probably discovering a new species. And so to, to, to accommodate that, if we can do it to classify it to genus level, then the scientists already can like, have a lot less to look at, right? We can help scientists to make that selection, what they're looking at, carefully. Great. So just by adding structure, we're doing better with many downstream tasks already being developed from BioClip uh, foundation model. But wait, there is more. <laughs> um, what if we add different structures for different reasons, right? So we can, rather than adding taxonomy, just this basic classification of species, we can add phylogeny. So using ph phylogeny encodes the evolutionary history of, uh, of species development. It's a different structure. And so with using phylogeny, we created this, um, hmm, we also lose, lost some colors, that's okay. Um, we created this uh, process of encoding the, uh, uh, the, the, the features, the parts of the image in a hierarchical way that are guided by the, by, by the phylogeny so that by different parts of, and from very deep evolution to present time, and by encoding this, the, the, the latent space features, not the image features, the latent space features using the encoder, um, we create what we call an imageome that corresponds to the history of the phylogeny for a group of species. And then with the decoder, with this uh, given that in latent space encoding, you, we can use the decoder to generate for any space there candidates for ancestral species. So this is hypothesis generation. This is generating not only like what these ancestral species may have looked like, and yes, we are now validating it with synthetic evolution simulations to make sure that we're recovering what, we're, what we think we're recovering, but it also allows for, in, for recent evolution, especially testable hypothesis, because natural history collections of many museums, of many places in the world, do hold back you know, species collections hundreds of years back. So we can start validating some of the ancestrals, what some of these hypotheses hypothetical species look like. And that allows us to place 
mutation of particular traits, like the fin, the fins uh, in, in this you know, hypothetical species, ancestral species, in the context of evolutionary time. We can also conduct experiments that, like the gene level experiments that are gene knockout and um, gene swapping, we can do this at the evolutionary level in, by using the imageom and either masking out part of the imageom with replacing it with noise or swapping. So we can swap parts of this imageom, the encoding in the latent space, right, the latent space features, and then generate a hypothetical species, what they would have looked like if that part was swapped. Again, that allows testing of the ancestral mutations and the impact of the ancestral kind of genome variations on the morphological traits of the species. So this is a paper that is um, just, uh, ex just accepted to ECCV. Uh, and you can play with it. You can create your own evolution and test it. And there are, there's evidence there already that uh, it actually recovering things like, you know, a re relatively discrete swap from, from uh, fuse tail to split tail and the shape of the head and this collection of species of fish, minnows. But with the synthetic evolution and sort of validation of it, we can really provide a powerful tool for, for scientists. But we and get to the point, so how do we actually get from this hypothesis generation to interpretation? And so that's the third in a set of tools that came out of Imageomics recently uh, at iClear, published at iClear um, this year, is the interpretable transformers for trade discovery. By adding species-specific detection layers before and after the, um, the, 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 the uh, transformers, right, the transformer architecture, sort of this particular tension layers. We go from the typical um, kind of very washed out uh, saliency maps or tension maps to this very, very specific, and it is per species attention layers. So very specific to this species, in this case painted bunting, that picks up on the pixels that are the outline of the bird, the specific traits like the orange belly and the blue head, so the attention is on the belly, the chest, the head. And when you show it, and you can do it from, from any viewpoint, even the, the ones that it has not seen, it still picks out why it makes determination that, like these are the pixels that, that are salient. In this case, the attention for making determination is painted bunting. When you show it an image not of the right species as the bottom row, it's like the pixels are all over the place, right? The attention is all over the place. It's like, I don't know, I got nothing. Right? And so with that, it's really starting to pick out the parts of the organism that are relevant, including the parts that humans may not be paying attention to, and allows us using off-the-shelf methods, like you know, segment anything model, to start segmenting based on attention for looking for traits and create things like taxonomic keys, which is what scientists and many uh, practitioners use to separate, is it this species or that, right? There's a kind of binary tree. Why does it matter? Why is it that, you know, like, are we only recovering what humans already know? Well, the thing is, no, not really. We know, again, we know a lot about very little. We know a lot about few species. We know about a lot about few ecosystems and areas. And we know a lot about a small subset of traits that are important. Why? For many reasons. One, because you know, that's what biologists found interesting. But fundamentally, because humans are limited. As humans, we have a flaw, well, we have a very limited, actually, I mean, great but relatively limited sensory input 
architecture, even for vision. So there is a paper that came out almost two years ago that showed that humans do not have enough, do not have enough red orange acuity to separate between uh, types of particular moth. Not surprising, the coloring in moths and butterflies and many other insects evolved not for the human vision benefit, but for their predators, birds mostly. Right? Birds have no problem separating between different phenotypes of moths and having, seeing that red-orange acuity in that spectra, and neither do machine learning uh, methods. And even when we can see, we also don't have the ability to quantify some of the traits. So if I ask you, okay, let's see another uh, interactive part. Which two zebras are, zebra stripes are more similar to each other, the top pair or the bottom pair? Right, if you think the top pair stripes are more similar to each other, raise your hand. What about the bottom pair? All right, it's about 50-50, and it's about right. We have no way of doing it. No amount of training will let you be able to do this in any objective way. Because we evolved to recognize and similarity first and foremost in faces. We have no problem saying, oh, look, the baby looks like its mom, the baby looks like its dad, or like this famous celebrity. But we cannot tell whether the baby zebra stripes look like its moms. And so together, not only sort of the acuity, the spectra, this ability to quantify, leaves a lot of even the visual traits, the observable, visually observable traits, unaccessible, invisible to humans. And they may be actually very important. So how do we develop approaches? How do we now start looking, making this invisible visible? We can. So here's an example from uh, a classic example, ooh, a classic example of mimicry in nature. So Heliconia's butterflies, what you're looking at here, there are two species, only two species here. Heliconia serrato, the red ones, the red boxes, and Heliconia smilpomene, the yellow boxes. And notice how similar they are. Pair for pair, in every region they co-occur, they mimic each other. In fact, it's thought that the yellow ones, the milpomene, mimics erato, but it's not clear. And why do they do this? Well, because one of them, erato, doesn't taste good to the birds that eat them. But uh, the, the, so the birds learn, learned not to eat the butterflies that look like that. Great. The other ones, you know, the ones that look differently, the birds would eat. And so there is the natural selection that drove the ones that look similar to the bad tasting ones to survive. And so there is region from region mimicry. And they do it with half the genome, by the way, the mimics. So first, is there a signal that machine learning can pick up? The answer is yes. Basic contrastive learning gives you an embedding uh, space where you can measure the distance and show the distance between the uh, two images of the same species is small, between two images of different non-mimic species is large, and between co-mimic species is in the middle. Great, there is a signal we can pick up. But the real question is, how do the birds and the butterflies see them? Because their vision is different. So here's the acuity transformation of the original images to the right species of birds and the right species of butterflies, male butterflies, in fact. So do you notice the difference between the human, the center one, and the, and the bird, the leftmost acuity? No, right? We can't, <laughs> but trust me, there is a difference. We just, we don't see it. Birds do, if you can ask a bird. And so what, it, what we then did, we essentially trained a classifier on one species, Erato, and asked it to do zero-shot uh, placement for the mimics. 
right? Can it identify the mimics? And what this plot shows you that birds with bird acuity, and we did it both ways, uh, for train and Rado recognize the mimics of Milpomene, train and Milpomene classify, uh, recognize the mimic of Rado. So the, the plot shows that birds had a lower error than butterflies in doing so. So they were better at recognizing mimics, meaning that they see the mimics as the same species, with as butterflies don't really. Well, they can still see the similarities. So we're continuing this, these experiments, um, because the next step is why, what, what do they see different, what do birds see as similar and butterflies do see as different? And we are back to enter the interpretable transformer to highlight the parts of the image that uh, are, that are specific to a species or similar to the mimics. And what you can see here, the parts that are picked up automatically by, the, by Inter are exactly at the bottom here, examples where in guides, scientific guides for butterflies, these arrows point to how humans should distinguish those co-mimic species. Right, they're very, very subtle differences, like this presence or absence of the white uh, on the wing, on the tip of the wing, and that's exactly what's picked up the hot spot uh, by, by the interpretable, by inter. Similarly, this, you know, the last white spot is squashed a little. Again, very subtle differences picked up by inter. So we can now build this set of keys that allows, that allows us to distinguish between the two species and do it both for the bird vision and for the butterfly vision, which is what we're doing right now. And I wish I could show you the results, but not yet. But then, here's how you validate this hypothesis, because all of it is just a hypothesis. The cool way to validate it is that you can print the artificial butterflies with just the features that supposedly look similar to birds or just the features that supposedly look different to butterflies and put them in an in a enclosure and let the birds, you know, peck. And you can count the number of pecks, pecks the holes from the beaks <laughs> on these paper butterflies to see whether your hypothesis is that this is what they see as similar or this is what they see as different actually true. So this is an amazing, to me, the amazing opportunity to validate these hypotheses that are generated by AI, right? By machine learning and computer vision. It's a very different way of, of using machine learning. I don't care about the accuracy actually in this case, right? I care about the validated or testable scientific hypothesis. And we're gonna ask the birds to test it. Great. So there's a lot more that's going on in imageomics from very micro tasks like placing, uh, like trait segmentation and placing uh, landmarks, semantically meaningful biological landmarks uh, with trait discovery and uh, connecting it to genotype, which right now we're literally running in parallel these imageomics-based approaches for, for connecting phenotype to genotype as well as CRISPR and genome-wide association studies. Very cool, watch this place. Um, but also uh, behavior from videos and these sort of continuing with the foundation model. Our next foundation model we're already putting together about over 200 million images. This is a huge collaboration of many, many, many partners from Smithsonian Institution, National Ecological Observatory uh, Network, uh, iNaturalist, and many others kind of to really bring together a less biased uh, source of biodiversity data. We can also, of course, it's not limited to just you know, organisms in the wild, it is, or even just animals, it's all beyond animals, all of this is true, what we're doing is also for plants. I didn't show you an example, but it's you know, not only in the wild, in the lab, it's applicable to uh, agriculture, digital agriculture and to cellular level as well as landscape level. So there's, this is the science, right? 
is this kind of, and while digital agriculture and understanding science and making scientific discovery is great, and I can spend a whole talk just talking about that, I wanna show you an example of impact. Like what is all of this, kind of how we can bring it all the way to making a difference in biodiversity loss, and why do we care? Because one of the biggest challenges that we're facing today is the loss of biodiversity of the world. You know, we're seeing this, seeing these dire warnings that one million species are facing extinction. And remember, how many species are there non-bacterial? 10 million, so about 10% of the living world, of the biodiversity of the living world is facing extinction. This is a shockingly high number. I mean, we're in the middle of what's been termed the sixth mass extinction. And so what we need, because this is an urgent and huge challenge, what we need is AI for decision support. We need to connect AI to domain metrics, such as the global biodiversity metrics, global conservation goals, or very, very local, you know, preserve-specific, habitat-specific conservation metrics. And we need to make AI actionable. It is not about the accuracy, it's about will it make a difference in the decisions that are being taken using the information from AI. Right? And so this is the, the core of the report of the Global Partnership on AI Group on AI and Biodiversity. Um, so Global Partnership on AI is a kind of global think tank to a think tank. It's a collection of experts who come together to, to, to uh, lead the, both the scientific and policy thought in particular areas of AI applications and AI foundations. So we're part of the group on AI and biodiversity, uh, subject matter experts, and really there's four areas if we're summarizing a lot of detail. AI can make a difference in missing data and sort of bridging the biodiversity data gap, understanding the drivers of biodiversity loss, you know, um, bringing in resources, to mitigate biodiversity so, uh, loss and uh, assess the policy and action impact, whether it's actually making a difference. So how can we actually do it? One of the easiest, kind of the lowest, big, uh, hanging for the biggest, quickest impact is about the, the, the bridging the data gap because it's massive. We're losing biodiversity faster than we can name the species. Just think about it for a second. You know that there is, you know, 10% of all biodiversity is faced with extinction. Majority of the species that, that are, and this is probably an underestimate. We don't, we haven't even had a chance to name them. Beetles. But, so the, the, uh, International Union for Conservation of Nature Red List, which is the official international organization that determines the conservation status of species and monitors the biodiversity of the world. So when we say the species are endangered, it is because, because the Species Commission for IUCN Red List for that species based on certain metrics, and metrics are important, such as population size, trend, and so on, determine that the status is endangered. And that bears, that, that comes with a lot of implications because that means that there are different resource allocations, different policy and so on to protect the species. So of the 160,000 or so species that IUCN Red List monitors, and this is out of the 10 million, tiny fraction to begin with, more than 22,000, actually, more than 22,000, the official conservation status is species is data deficient, meaning we don't even have the basic data to have the basic metrics to make the basic decisions. Data deficient. And for about 60,000 more, the population trend is unknown. So if you're keeping track of the math, 
That's more than half. More than half of those 160,000 monitored species we really don't know. And these are not obscure species. These are not beetles. Killer whales, the biggest dolphin in the ocean, hard to miss, orcas, right? Data deficient. Polar bears, iconic conservation species. Population trend is unknown. If we don't know something about these guys, what hope do we have for beetles? And notice across the taxa, just the fraction of, of the different kind of, we know a lot about vertebrates. Again, it's the same pattern. We know a lot about very little. We know a lot about vertebrates, a little less about insects, even less about plants, weirdly, and almost nothing about fungi, right? The species assessed right now for fungi, again, so more recent numbers, are just over 300 species. That's probably less than you have in the, lo in the local woods. So what do we do? How do we bear all of AI to really fill this ga these gaps? And so that is the goal of the newly funded by National, US National Science Foundation and Canadian NSERC uh, AI and Biodiversity Change Global Climate Center that brings together very passionate <laughs> researchers and practitioners to contribute AI-enabled tools and methods that describe the impact, describe and help understand the impact of climate change, particularly on the part where we don't know a lot, on unobserved ecosystems and unknown species, on species discovery, on rare species, vulnerable species, species in the, at the edges of the ecosystems or in the habitats that are particularly vulnerable to change. Speci to understand the response of biodiversity and you know, from species to ecosystems to the increasing frequency and scale of natural disasters such as floods, fires, droughts, and hurricanes. Right? So really focusing on that very long tail of where we don't know a lot or even anything at all at this point. So here are the couple of examples of how we already started making a difference. So this is uh, uh, focusing on taxa that has been unobserved until now. So we have camera traps, motion activated cameras that are very, very good for large animals, particularly mammals, um, but not good for invertebrates. And so led by David Rolnick's group out of McGill, who is part of AI and Biodiversity Change, ABC Global Climate Center, developed a very different camera trap that's activated by, mo that attracts moths and activated by, takes pictures of them. And then the whole pipeline of not only sort of detection classification, but all the way to candidates for new species discovery, right? Again, this is driving this, this need-based discovery part. Um, not only that, but it also changes this whole context is how we ask questions. And so that is the focus of yet another member of ABC, Global Climate, uh, Global uh, Center, is Sarah Beery from MIT and her group are leading a uh, study on the largest citizen science platform for nature observation, iNaturalist, to figure out what is it that people, both scientists and conservation practitioners, want to know on these data. So you can play with it, there is a demo, but uh, these are kind of building towards complex queries to, that you can ask on this data, on the iNaturalist data. It's things like, um, a tamandua pup be, uh, being carried on its mother's back. It's seen description for ecology, seen description for biodiversity, right? Um, the, the reef with man-made structures and debris, these are the kinds of queries that you can kind of, people are interested in, in, in finding in this data, and so they're building the methods that actually can respond to these kinds of queries. 
So changing the question and making sort of complex multi and making sense of complex multimodal data in the process. The other direction is focusing on the fine grain classification, the really, really fine grain feature extraction. So this is not only being able to tell you all the way down to species who is in the picture, but really down to individual animal. Not only Gravy Zebra is in this case, but Zippy the Zebra and Joe the Giraffe and Terry the Turtle and Willie the Whale. And we can do it, so that's the platform that we built um, started in 2013, but there are many, many, many sort of methods developed for individual animal recognition over the years um, by a, again, large and diverse group of people and built a platform called Wildbook with many instances of Wildbook for different collections of species. And so, uh, we, because we can do it for any striped, spotted, wrinkled, notched animals, including using the shape of a whale's fluke or the dorsal fin of a dolphin, so underwater, on the ground, in the air. And there are platforms now for over 70 species, including my favorite, uh, the uh, weedy and leafy sea dragons. These are like alien-looking seahorse-related species. Indicator species for coral reefs, by the way. But one of the most recent additions to these platforms, to the species of these platforms, are in the whale group. Any guesses? Orcas, killer whales. And because you can recognize them actually pretty easily, we're very quickly accumulating data to help IUCN Red List Species Commission to transition them from data deficient to actual conservation status to figure out. Um, because, and, and why do we think that we can do it? Because we have examples. Over the years, one of the first species that was added to wild books was uh, whale sharks, the largest fish in the ocean. And so whale sharks are part of the shark book, subsection of wild book, um, with more than 22,000 uniquely identified individual sharks coming from more than 110,000 observations contributed both by volunteers, professionals, scientists, uh, conservation projects, as well as you know, partially from social media. And together, these data changed the IUCN Red List status, conservation status of the species from vulnerable to, extinct, uh, to endangered, not extinct, from vulnerable to endangered, and the population trend from stable to decreasing, not because the species are doing worse, but because we have better data to make that determination. And that means better policy, better evaluation of policy, better action to save the species, and we're already, this was determination that was made um, seven years ago, and this we're already starting to see the change in the trend. And that the difference that you know, being able to look at more data more carefully made this difference. Um, also, uh, contributing the same data contributed to the most comprehensive understanding of the biology of the species, uh, and just by, uh, because only by putting it together. These are global species. There's not one project, not one individual that knows everything about these species. So we have to share data and we build technology, we build AI that enables not only AI as a partner to humans, but humans as partners to other humans. To really put together the global picture of a global species. The same technology also enabled the first ever full census count of an entire species, the endangered gravy zebra. There's about 3,000 of them left in the world, most of them in Kenya. There are a few hundred in Ethiopia. 
And so for the first time in 2016, hundreds of people were driving around the country in Kenya taking pictures of every gravy zebra that they saw. And this is everybody from um, the, the, the you know, kids from schools all over the country and local park rangers to tourists with telephoto cameras and US ambassador to Kenya at the time, Bob Godek, who was pictured there. So, you know, hundreds of people took 40,000 plus images of, of every zebra that they saw, and it turns out pretty much every zebra that exists, we've tested it since. And because we had such great coverage, we got the most accurate census to date, and Kenya Wildlife Service changed from this is not how we count zebras to this is exactly how we're going to do this. You know, from now on, you're on the hook every two years. So we repeated the, we supported the event in 2018 and 2020 and 2024. And so in 2018, there were more, more people, more pictures, more zebras, turns out. We could provide very, very, very tight uh, confidence bounds because we, the coverage was so good, and that matters. We could lower the barrier to entry. All you have to do is take a picture to participate, and that matters. But more than any algorithm, the best algorithm would not build the trust in the process if people could not participate, if everybody couldn't participate. The tagline for the event was Kenyans powering conservation. And to make that happen, we got donations of GPS-enabled uh, cameras. We created a very, very old school way, those QR codes, to synchronize everybody's cameras with the one GPS-enabled camera in every car. So not everybody had to have those GPS cameras. Um, the working with local nonprofit organizations created a whole booklet explaining what's going to happen, why is it happening, where the pictures are going to go, and what the scientists and, and conservation organizations are going to do with them. And then up and down the country did these training sessions in English, Kiswahili, and Samburu to make sure that everybody knew what they were doing and understood why they were doing it and really had the buy-in of everybody. And then trained the staff of the conservation organizations to use Wildbook so they could do the data analysis themselves. Well, it turns out we had to do it again and again, but I want that t-shirt. <laughs> and this is why Kenya Wildlife Service and the six governors of the counties that have gravy zebras actually signed on in the proclamation for the endangered species management out using that data, using that process. Putting resources, money, people, land, setting aside land for the conservation based on that data. And the, uh, Simon Gitao from Kenyan Wildlife Service said something that nearly made me cry. This shows the power of citizen science and machine learning for conservation. That was the first time to the best of everybody's knowledge that the words machine learning were used by Kenya Wildlife Service official in history. <laughs> right, so I hopefully I gave you a little bit of a sense of how in a very different way AI, particularly machine learning, but even broader computation can make a difference for conservation, for bio, to mitigate biodiversity loss by bringing in more data. I didn't show you about, you know, deepening understanding of the drivers of biodiversity loss or how improving the resource allocation or the policy, evaluating policy in action. There is a lot more to do. And if I have one call to action, is this list of maybe sort of, even if you don't want to focus at all on the learn anything about the difference between taxonomy and phylogeny and do something about the uh, science of of, of biodiversity or science of ecology, or conservation is not your gig, or maybe it is your gig, but you don't know how to contribute as a machine learning professional, here's the list. We, you know, and these are big challenges in machine learning. How do we add domain knowledge to machine learning sort of intrinsically, not by just kind of external extrinsic translations. So this is the knowledge-guided machine learning paradigm, but you know, expanding this. How do we focus on that very long tail and stop getting even more sort of overfit for the 
like very small part of what we already know. How do we create methods for open sets, for out of distribution, for out of domain kind of uh, settings? Methods for novelty discovery, not for accuracy on large benchmark data sets. How do we quantify uncertainty? Huge problem, both in science, in AI for science and AI for decision support. Multimodal data analysis, and my favorite is model composition. We have a lot of models for different parts of understanding ecosystems, of understanding large complex systems. Can we, how can we integrate these models? How can we use model composition, particularly to include domain knowledge, domain models in the process? And how do we make this human-machine partnership by design, not as an afterthought? And all of this wouldn't happen without the large partnership of a large number of people all over the world, as I said, who are dedicated, passionate, and who are behind most of what I showed to you today. It's not only uh, biologists and computer scientists, but it is also a large number of people who are collect out there collecting data and making it usable, sort of, and passionately working in the field day to day to make sure that we still have the biodiversity of the world. If you want to join, also very recently there was an open session, information session for all the labs where each, every lab that works at this intersection of AI and biodiversity, AI and ecology, presented sort of three minute intro. It's on YouTube, you can find sort of labs all over the world that do this kind of work, this kind of research. Because if we do this, if we succeed, and rather when we succeed, the payoff is immense not only in the scientific discovery and understanding the natural world, but also making a difference to save the biodiversity of our wonderful planet. Thank you.